Timothy, so good to see you. Wonderful to be here. Thank you. Timothy Brown, you've done amazing work even before we met at Yale School of Forestry mm -hmm. and Environmental Studies, where you were a student and on staff, and now you're at Nat Geo. Mm -hmm. But I want to begin with your own studies mm -hmm. that had science and humanities mm -hmm. and that led you towards story. So give us the science and humanities mixture. Yeah, was your thank background. you. Yeah. Well, I started out as a wildlife biologist. I studied at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. And I focused on forest carnivores there, specifically on Canada lynx, and worked for a time with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service studying Canada lynx shortly after they'd been listed on the endangered species list. And uh, despite the very holistic and integrated education that I'd gotten at Evergreen, I never was taught to think about my science as a story mm -hmm. or what the story of my research actually was. And uh, I was at a... a town meeting, a town hall in the southern Washington Cascades, um, where we were to talk about the status of the lynx. And um, there were many town members that were loggers, ranchers, uh, had lived in the community for a long time. And uh, that was the first time I started to think, I'm coming at this from a very privileged position thinking that my science is quote unquote fact mm -hmm. and that this perception is uh, somehow rooted in an empirical truth that I just need to convey these facts to this, this community and they'll understand the importance of why we need to protect the lynx uh, and these forests. And I started to realize that my perspective was actually one story of many stories in terms of who, who we are on the planet, our relationship to the forest, our relationship to the lynx, uh, what the links actually are as a being on the planet, and that also that the stories that these community members were bringing to this meeting were equally as valid as the scientific data that I was presenting. Mm -hmm. um, but so that was the first time I started to think about story like that. But it wasn't until actually I became a high school environmental science teacher. And I started to see the ways in which popular culture are presenting a very different narrative about who we are as people, who we are as a society, what we're doing on the planet, what we should value, what we should value as success, that I started to think really conscientiously about, as a science teacher and as somebody who is trained in the sciences, how do I use story to be a more effective scientist, environmentalist, and passionate activist for the earth? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I love that. So it was after this work on the West Coast and so on, that you came to School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Correct. And there you were also trying to infuse this sense of need for story. And you did Correct. this quite remarkable conference yeah. on story. Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah, so it was, uh, it was a conference uh, supported by uh, Peter Crane when he was the dean of the school. And uh, we partnered with the National Geographic Society, and we called it the Science and Storytelling Symposium. And my goal was to integrate the sciences, the humanities, and the arts around a common theme, um, you know, looking at story and the role that story plays in the environmental crisis and in potential solutions to the environmental crisis that we all face. And so at the conference, we had people like Jacques Reynolds, who at the time was the curator at the Yale Art Gallery, moderating a panel on artistic perceptions of nature. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time as we had Oswald Schmitz, who's a population ecologist, a hard-nosed quantitative scientist, hosting a panel on effective uh, communication in the sciences. So it was really an effort to integrate not only um, science and story, but really various members of the university who are oftentimes siloed away, busily working on their own research, and to see how we could start to come together with this common um, conversation and discussion around science and storytelling. Yeah, that was, I think, a historic, even watershed type of conference for mm. the School of the Environment at Yale, because just as you said, the disciplines are so locked in, we can call it disciplinolatry. Right, right. So you're now moving um, into this amazing work at National Geographic to take this forward. And mm. how is that going? It's going great. Thank you. So National Geographic, uh, as you know, they're a 130-year-old organization, uh, probably most famously known for our photography. Uh, but uh, a little-known fact is that when National Geographic magazine was first printed, it was all a text-based journal. 
Uh, and it wasn't until the early 1900s that the move was made to start to include photography in the magazine. It was a very controversial move. Hmm. And some people on the board and some of the, uh, the staff actually thought that it would uh, water down the quality of the publication to include photographs. Uh, but Alexander Graham Bell, who had been the president of the National Geographic Society, uh, was very passionate about the need for scientists to communicate to a wider audience and mm -hmm. not just to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And he felt that photography would be a critical aspect of that kind of broader communication. So here, 130 years later, after the founding of the organization, the National Geographic Society is once again committing itself to storytelling specifically. And the program that I'm running is the National Geographic On-Campus Initiative. And this is a way to bring National Geographic uh, resources, talent, and assets to university students nationwide through these live science and storytelling symposia. They include a full day of integrated discussions where we have National Geographic photographers, writers, filmmakers, and explorers in conversation with scholars from the partner university around a host of issues related to uh, the Earth crisis, wildlife, uh, you know, and storytellers for change, ways you can actually use storytelling regardless of your field of study to make a bigger impact in the world. In addition, we have a series of workshops in storytelling that are free and open to all students regardless mm. of, of field of study or major where they can partner with a National Geographic photographer or investigative journalist mm. for a day, gain some real uh, world skills and also start to cultivate an opportunity to tell their story mm -hmm. and how they're approaching some of these issues and potential solutions to the crises that we face. Incredible. You, so you've taken a model from what you did at Yale um, and you have this opportunity to expand it, diversify it and indigenize it within these different campuses and so on. Exactly. Um, it's truly amazing. And your sense is that this is already having resonance. I mean, the fact that National Geographic picked it up and says this is important to do. Exactly. And I would suggest, but I want to hear from you, partly because science has not been able to communicate fully to a wider audience. Right? Absolutely. There's been a huge failure. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, uh, the climate crisis yeah. is what really has brought this to the fore. Yes. Uh, an understanding that the narrative that was told for so many years around climate change was really ineffective. Yeah. It was this, uh, this doomsday scenario, uh, and it left people feeling very hopeless. Mm -hmm. It was a scenario that was painted by numbers and graphs yeah. rather than narrative yeah. that integrated people into the story. Right. And very critically, what we're trying to do at National Geographic, like I said, is to empower students to share their stories. Yes. And we feel very strongly that by giving people the tools to be their own best storytellers, mm -hmm. uh, to partner, if they're a photographer, to partner with a quantitative or database scientist like that uh, and develop these sort of collaborations. Uh, and likewise, if they're a, a database, quantitative-based scientist, to understand the values of story. And we use this term storytelling quite broadly to include you know, text-based narrative storytelling, digital storytelling, moving pictures, mm -hmm. um, uh, the internet, um, and, and even like expanding into worlds like virtual reality and, uh, and AR. So um, we want to really start to think about ways that we can integrate the sciences and storytelling together mm -hmm. so, that, so that we can really start to address some of the issues and some of the crises that I think are being uh, unfortunately, not addressed in an effective manner. Yeah, and what strikes me, maybe this is a way to wind up such a rich, fabulous life experience, your yeah. own, going into this amazing national project, really, yeah. from one of our great institutions, National yeah. Geographic. Um, and so what strikes me is, as you said, climate change has opened up this gate. Mm -hmm. um, and especially because science would say, as you did earlier, we have the facts. Mm -hmm. And then maybe some ethicists and religious folks and environmentalists would say, we have the ethics here and this right. is how it should be, right. right? So facts and values were in two different universes. Absolutely. And even trying to just say, let's get together, mm -hmm. doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, but by putting, as you said so eloquently, stories as a vehicle forward, these become commingled mm -hmm. and much more clear mm -hmm where people can feel participating mm -hmm. in solutions. Absolutely. I think it's also a way to sort of 
um, get people to understand the scientific imperative uh, that, that what the data actually shows us, for example, with, with the climate crisis. Yeah. You know, we're facing a really very, very serious situation. But if you just throw numbers at people, that doesn't do it. Right. We know that that doesn't do right. it. And if you paint doomsday scenarios, that doesn't do it. But if you share somebody's lived experience, uh, whether it's you know their experience of seasonal change, mm-hmm. whether it's their experience of uh, rising seas, whether it's their experience of uh, their ability to produce food, mm-hmm. um, we start to understand what climate change actually means on a human level, right? Right, and then I think people will be more inspired to take action. Yeah, you know, at these university convenings, we're not reaching out to just science students and journalism students, though. We're actually trying to involve students from across the university because we also feel very strongly that it's important that universities start to acknowledge um, their their role in solution making, right. you know, not just, uh, not just to produce papers or things like that, but how can we actually integrate our knowledge yeah. together? So we have people coming to these events who are from the medical sciences and from the social sciences and from the arts and the humanities, you know, so it's a very different arena for National Geographic to be thinking about how we're going to use story to engage some of these types of yeah, students. Yeah, yeah, it's fabulous. And yeah. as you've just said, science to solutions is really a way forward. And we don't have to get stuck in advocacy or activism or politics, but we're all looking for solutions. Absolutely. To the future of life. Absolutely. On the planet. Absolutely. Timothy, this is great. Thanks for the Thank time. Thank you so much. much. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you.